Number 10, The Age Gap. When it was announced that Billie Eilish and Jesse Rutherford became an item mid-October, fans were very shocked to say in the least. The couple were spotted holding hands at Halloween Horror Night. Days later, they were photographed publicly making out outside of a popular restaurant in LA. Concerns were raised almost immediately around their age difference. If you don't know, Billie is 20 years old while Jesse is 31. The 11 year age gap between them is not a big deal on its own, but it immediately gets worse when you consider that Billie entered the public image as a 15 year old. It's it's normal for fans to feel a certain type of way about her dating someone old enough to have a mortgage. But of course, there's also the argument that as long as they're happy, they're both consenting adults and that's what really matters. Number 9, the Halloween costume. The internet practically exploded when the photos were leaked of Jessie and Billy's disturbing couple's Halloween costume. If you're wondering about how they could possibly make people feel more icky about their relationship, Billy decided to dress up as a baby and Jessie went as an old man. But it was a couple's costume. The thing is that they were probably poking fun at people criticizing their age difference. But yes, there's plenty of reason for people to feel a little grossed out by their costume because it plays right into that creepy age stuff. Twitter was very quick to react to the photos, with one user writing, I wish I could wash my eyes with soap and scrub this from my mind. Another tweet said, the baby costume alone was okay. Seeing the whole picture, this is weird. They do get points for being self-aware, but the costume somehow made everything a little gross. Number eight, when they met. According to photos posted by a Jesse Rutherford fan, Fan account on Twitter, Billy and Jesse have actually known each other since 2017, when Billy was 15 and still on the rise as a musician. One viral tweet summed up the situation very well, saying Jesse Rutherford is literally 31 and Billy is not even 21 yet. They also posted a photo of a teenage Billy Eilish posing next to him. Someone commented under the photo saying she's still not old enough to drink alcohol and he's a grown man. While another user wrote, I had my years of thinking guys a decade older were normal. It's not. The post certainly calls into question the idea of what's appropriate and what's not in their relationship. But to be clear, at that point, they had not started dating yet. Number seven, disturbing allegations. Last week, the neighborhood shocked fans when they announced the firing of their drummer, Brandon Fried, after several women came forward accusing him of SA. One of the women was Maria Zadoya, the lead singer of the LA-based indie pop band, The Marias. She made a post on the group's Instagram account on Sunday. Brandon had touched her inappropriately while at a bar the previous evening. She said it was one of the the most uncomfortable things I've ever experienced. I felt an invasion of my space, privacy, and body. Y'all need a new drummer. Brandon responded by apologizing for being such a drunk guy, but shortly after his post, the neighborhood announced nomination in a statement shared on the band's social media account. Maria's post drew outcry from fans who called on Brandon's bandmates for accountability, including lead singer Jesse. Many people called him out for staying silent about the allegations. In response to the news, one user tweeted, first Jesse Rutherford, now Brandon Fried. Wow, the neighborhood is so cooked. Number six, his song lyrics. Something that's been constantly brought up online in the wake of people finding out about Jesse and Billy's relationship is that they can no longer look at the music the same way. The reason being is that several of the neighborhood's track feature songs that center around the concept of being too young for certain things, like their hit song Daddy Issues, for example, because it's widely believed that the lyrics reference a young woman seeking to have a relationship with an older man in order to recreate the toxic or non-existent relationship that she had with her father. Pretty controversial stuff. And of course, people are drawing parallels between that song and the singer's romance with the much younger Billy. One user tweeted, The neighborhood has a whole new meaning now that Jesse Rutherford is a creep. Another person wrote, Full disclosure, I really love the music of the neighborhood and have for years. But that doesn't really mean anything. I would much rather protect the women in the industry. Number five, Billy was a fan. Around the same time that Billy and Jesse first met when she was 15 and he was 26, the point that keeps being brought up is that she was always a big fan of his music and therefore she was easily able to be influenced by someone that she considered her favorite artist. The Neighborhood first formed in 2011 and came onto the music scene not long after. So it's no surprise that they would have had a crowd of young fans by that point. For her part, Billy started working on songs with her brother Phineas in 2015 when she was only 13 years old. At that time, her brother had already been writing and producing music for several years and had his own band. In 2016, 14 year old Billy would go on to release her first hit song titled Ocean Eyes and she explored loaded on the music scene. Although she certainly had a promising career ahead of her when she first met Jesse, some fans still believe that because she was a fan of him at the time, there was already a precedent set for a power imbalance in their relationship. Number four, the internet's reaction. It's safe to say that Billy and Jesse's relationship has been one of the most criticized to date. Judging from the reactions on the internet, you can clearly see that the majority of Billie Eilish fans almost believe that there is something inherently wrong with their relationship and there's something off about it. Even though the couple themselves have 
come out in defense of their romance. One user tweeted, Jesse Rutherford's 31 years old, but he's dating Billie Eilish who's 20. This has happened so many times too. Grown men in the industry have been preying on Billie through so-called romantic relationships. Also, he's known her since she was 15 and he was 26 at the time. Some have even compared it to Taylor Swift's relationship with a much older John Mayer, saying the whole Taylor Swift John Mayer thing happened like 14 years ago. And the fact that people's reaction to that and their reaction now to 31 year old Jesse Rutherford from the neighborhood dating 20 year old Billie Eilish is just saying that they're both adults so it's fine. It's baffling to me. Number three, the family's response. A lot of Billie fans have been calling out her family for supporting her relationship. Someone tweeted, Billie Eilish and Maria of the Marias deserves the love and defense y'all are willing to give to white men you think are very, very weird for blaming Billie Eilish for potentially dating a 30 year old man at 19. When the real conversation should be, how is her family allowing her to be continuously groomed and manipulated by these grown ass men with no interference? This backlash is largely due to response from Billie's older brother Phineas when he was asked about Jesse Rutherford. The 25 year old musician claimed that he was fully supportive of his little sister's relationship. He said, listen, as long as she's happy, I'm happy. A source close to the star has also claimed that Jesse and Phineas get along very well and that he has even seen a change in Billie over the years and said that she is ready for the relationship. So obviously he doesn't seem to see any issue whatsoever. Number two, the couple's outfit. The new couple divided fans with their debut outfit. Ever since Billie and Jesse started dating earlier this year, they have generally kept their public appearances to a minimum. Up until their debut, they had never been seen together officially on any red carpet event. But recently at a star-studded gala in LA, they finally made an appearance together in bold style. The two of them divided the internet once again when they opted for comfy monogrammed Gucci pajamas, accessorized with an eye mask, slippers, and a blanket. And yes, they were both wrapped up together. Some people thought it was adorable, and as usual, others thought it was just way too much. The PJs were definitely a surprise given the formality of the event. Billy wore a crop top, a long skirt with a lace trim slit, and a long robe that was all monogrammed in Gucci's signature house print. As for Jesse, he wore a silky loungewear set, including a button up shirt and trousers, finished off with a pair of Gucci house slippers. So, was it a fit or not? Well, that's still to be decided. And coming in at number one, hiding their relationship. In October this year, new News broke out about their relationship after a fan spotted the musicians holding hands as they exited a haunted house at Halloween's Horror Nights in LA. A video of their interaction ended up going viral on Twitter with many fans shocked at the news. Around the same time, they were also spotted eating dinner together at a vegan restaurant. Then on the 19th of October, pictures of them kissing outside a SoCal restaurant hit the press. The pair made it Instagram official when Billy posted some pictures of them on Halloween. There was also a short video of Jesse dressed as a clown. And on November the 6th, they made their their red carpet debut at the LACMA event, posing together under a Gucci branded blanket. So with the way things unraveled and how news of their romance started circulating online, so has speculation as to why the couple chose to be so cryptic about their relationship in the first place. Number 10, Blood Rituals. In an interview earlier this year with Glamour, Megan confirmed that the two of them engage in blood play. She said, so I guess to drink each other's blood might mislead people or people are imagining us with goblets and we're like Game of Thrones, drinking each other's blood. Blood. It's just a few drops, but yes, we do consume each other's blood on occasion for ritual purposes only. She went on to say that these rituals may depend on the lunar cycle, saying, so when I do it, it's a passage or it's used for a reason and it's controlled where it's like, let's shed a few drops of blood and each drink it. But when it comes to MGK, she says he's much more haphazard and hectic and chaotic, where he's willing to just cut his chest open with a broken glass and be like, take my soul. At first you think, well, that's fine. I mean, every couple has to have their own kinks, but maybe these two have been watching too much Twilight. This whole thing is a little too satanic for me. Number nine, that GQ interview. The couple opened up about their relationship to the magazine, hoping to paint themselves once again as a kind of Romeo and Juliet couple, but instead the internet started clowning on them. The article is titled True Romance, Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly are Hollywood's hottest new power couple. And here are some of the quotes. MGK said, even our first kiss, she wouldn't kiss me. We just put our lips right in in front of each other and breathed each other's breath and then she just left. Megan then spoke about their chemistry and said, it's ecstasy and agony for sure. I don't want people to think anything's perfect with us. I didn't say it was the darkest fairy tale for no reason. There's also the demonic side. Yes, there is certainly something demonic going on. Many internet users have since joked that their relationship is reminiscent of a really bad fan fiction with one viral meme that says, just saw Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox in public. Luckily grabbed a couple pics and it shows two teens dramatically embracing. Number eight, the thorn ring. When MG 
GK was asked about their engagement, he proudly told Vogue about what kind of engagement ring he had gifted his wife. As you would have expected, there's something incredibly sadistic about it. He claimed that the teardrop emerald ring he proposed to Meghan with was designed to inflict pain on her if she were to ever take it off. He said, it's a thoroughbred Colombian emerald with no treatment. It was just carved into the teardrop straight out of the mine. The concept is that the ring can come apart and make two rings. When it's together, it's held in place by a magnet. The bands are actually thorns. So if she tries to take it off, it hurts. The interviewer then questioned the choice of the ring and MGK just said, love is pain. So what does that tell you? Wanting to inflict pain on your partner when they choose to leave you is a textbook toxic relationship. But hey, I'm sure it's a pretty ring. Number seven, calling him daddy. Megan sent the incident into a collective frenzy during the 2021 MTV Video Music Awards while presenting alongside Kourtney Kardashian. Both women introduced their respective boyfriends, Machine Gun Kelly and Travis Barker, ahead of their performance. And the moment is still living rent free in my head to this day. Megan said, I'm a huge fan of this next performer. I've watched him grow, not just as an artist, but as a person. New York, I need you to get extra loud for our future baby daddies. Throughout the evening, Megan constantly refers to MGK as daddy. The 36 year old Transformers star walked the red carpet in a barely there, completely sheer dress with an embellished G string underneath. She then revealed to Entertainment Tonight during an interview that her fiance was behind the whole thing. Quote, he was like, you're gonna get naked tonight. I was like, whatever you say, daddy, whatever daddy says. Then later she posted a photo from that night on Instagram with the caption, daddy's gonna win a VMA. I mean, at this point, it's just too much. Number six comments about Halsey. One of the biggest red flags about a guy is the way he speaks about his ex-girlfriends. The rapper was briefly involved with the singer Halsey in 2017 before they parted ways. Even though the breakup seemed amicable, MGK chose to publicly embarrass her on a radio show. He went on the Breakfast Club radio show for an interview that was hosted by DJ Envy, Angela Lee and Charlemagne the God. He was asked if he and Halsey ever dated, to which he said no, but then Charlemagne asked him if they had ever smashed and he just smirked and he said yes. Now most decent people would respond to that question by simply declining to answer, but the way he said it was incredibly disrespectful. So what was Halsey's response to this mess? Well, she just tweeted how absolutely pathetic. To make matters worse, she was dating g Easy at the time and MGK dropped a diss track rubbing it in with lyrics saying that he effed his girl and accusing g Easy of copying his style by bleaching his hair blonde and wearing an earring, which is just trash behavior all round. Number five, the Halloween costume. The couple were recently accused of disrespecting the Catholic church after they dressed up in a fetishized version of religious costumes for Halloween this year. MGK dressed as a priest and Megan wore latex lingerie with thigh high boots. In photos posted online, they are both seen clutching rosary beads and a video shows the rapper feeding her communion while she crouches down on her knees in an explicit pose. To make matters worse, Megan captioned the photo saying, on Sundays we take communion. MGK also shared the video to his Instagram stories writing, God bless you. The comment section of course was flooded with criticism of their antics, with one follower writing, I'm not Catholic but this is so wrong in so many ways. With one user writing, I'm not Catholic but this is so wrong and in many ways making fun of religion. Respect requires respect so you guys lost mine. Another user wrote, this is just distasteful and I'm an atheist. While there's a good argument that religion is fair game when it comes to Halloween costumes, these guys found a way to just take it way too far. Number four, that Instagram post. These two are not only known for their over the top PDA, but also their cringy Instagram posts. In fact, their social media presence as a couple is so intense that people have said they give off a high school band kids after one week of dating vibe. So if you're feeling a little confused, let me show you one of the Instagram posts that Megan made. When she posted a photo of the two of them, she made the caption, the tale of two outcasts and star-crossed lovers caught in the throes of a torrid solar flare of a romance featuring feverish obsession, addiction, shamans, lots of blood, general mayhem, therapy, tantric night terrors, binding rituals, chakra sound baths, psychedelic hallucinations, a lot of their social media posts read like poorly written fan fiction. As a result, there's a running joke that they remind people of the Joker and Harley Quinn meme that says, she was fearless and crazier than him. She was his queen and God help anyone who dared disrespect his queen. Number three, dodging his kiss. There's bound to be moments of tension between every couple, but the video that was captured of Megan and MGK made people think they were actually going to break up. They're usually the king and queen of gross PDA, but during a red carpet, it 
appearance in April, the actress can be seen awkwardly avoiding a kiss from her fiance. The viral footage shows an uninterested Megan appearing to physically dodge a kiss from him. MGK laughed awkwardly at the rejection when he realized the cameras were on him. Megan then glared at him and made it apparent that he did something wrong. Around the same time, there was also an awkward video going around with the couple sitting alongside their cast members from the comedy movie called Good Morning. Fans couldn't help but notice that it was another moment when Megan just looked unhappy, especially because MGK was busy laughing with former Disney actress Dove Cameron. Number 2 Blood Necklace MGK took his song Bloody Valentine to a whole new level in February when he revealed that Megan had gifted him a drop of her blood to wear around his neck. He went on the Ellen DeGeneres show and said, well, she was actually going out of town to film a movie. This was really new in our relationship. I didn't have a passport either. So she was going out to Bulgaria, so I was kind of freaking out like, you're gonna leave me and I can't even come and see you. Some people give like a handkerchief to their partner or whatever. She gave me her DNA. So apparently because they didn't want to have to stress about spending time apart, she gave him an actual bit of her blood to carry around. Again, I don't know what it is with these two and blood, but as crazy as it sounds, they're not actually the first celebrity couple to do this. Back when Angelina Jolie and Billy Bob Thornton were married, they also wore necklaces with vials of each other's blood. So maybe it is romantic. Number one, always starting fight. The rapper got into an altercation with UFC star Conor McGregor that was seemingly unprovoked. The story goes that they were both on the MTV Music Video Awards red carpet when things escalated very quickly. In video footage of the incident, McGregor could be seen lunging at Kelly, who was held back by both security and Megan Fox. Seconds later, the fighter was escorted away, but not before he threw a cocktail in his direction. According to TMZ, McGregor walked up just to say hello when Kelly said something inaudible and pushed him, spilling one of his drinks in the process. Then MGK security attempted to push him away, and that's when the fight broke out. The UFC star later said, I only fight real fighters, people that actually fight. I certainly don't fight little vanilla ice white rappers. I don't even know the guy. I don't know anything about him except that he's with Megan Fox. It's pretty obvious who started the fight in this scenario, and time and time again, we are reminded of just how immature MGK can be. Number 10, lied about men's prison. When Nikita was arrested, fans were really shocked to find out that she was apparently being held in the men's unit in the correctional center. There was so much outrage for her plight that there was even a petition started online for her, which racked up 24,000 signatures. The petition stated that by being held in the men's unit, she was in immediate and very real danger from transphobes and predators, and that holding her there was a severe violation of her human rights. However, the Miami-Dade Corrections Facility has since come out and debunked those claims. They released a statement saying, Inmate Dragon never made it beyond the booking process prior to release. Therefore, she was never placed in the men's unit. All inmates undergoing our intake process remain in an open seating area in the presence of correctional staff. They also explained that Nikita was placed in a separate holding cell due to her high-profile status as an influencer, and apparently one of the officers who brought her in was also a part of the LGBTQ community himself. So it doesn't really seem like she was being held in the men's ward after all, but they might not have communicated that properly to her at the time. Number 9 Smiling in Court The video that went viral of Nikita was in the Miami-Dade Bond Court, and it shines a very bad light on her, because she appears to show zero remorse for her actions. In the clip, the 26-year-old can be seen wearing an orange prison jumpsuit while on a virtual call with the now famous Judge Mindy Glazer. As the details surrounding her arrest are being discussed, Nikita looks completely unbothered and appears to be smiling throughout the video. When she realizes that she is able to leave, she just smiles at the judge, waves, and blows her a kiss. It just makes it seem like she thinks the whole thing is a joke, despite the fact that she was charged with felony battery on a police officer, misdemeanor disorderly conduct, and misdemeanor battery. Judging from the clip, you could make the argument that she doesn't appear to understand the gravity of what she did, but she clearly wasn't taking it very seriously either. Luckily, Judge Glazer was very nice about it and didn't seem to think that she was being sarcastic. Number eight, couldn't pay her bond. It all started with a viral video of Nikita in jail talking to the judge, who asks her, do you have money to post the bond? Nikita then looks uncertain and asks how much is it? When she finds out that it'll be $2,000, she says, I might have to check. So when that video went viral, one of her fans, a Florida-based TikToker by the name of Ivy Wyatt, came to her rescue and ended up paying her bond. In a series of videos posted to TikTok, he explained that while he does not know Nikita personally and has only ever interacted with her over FaceTime, he believed that she was being 
bullied by jail staff. And that's why he wanted to help and get her out. So after paying her bond, he filmed himself in the car going to pick her up. But while he was in the parking lot of the correctional center, Nikita's management team apparently called him and told him to go home because they were already sending a car to retrieve her. This was around 2 a.m. But the whole thing was super shady because we already know that didn't happen. And Nikita got picked up by a group of random fans. Number seven, picked up by fans. There's no way to downplay how crazy this is, but Nikita ended up getting picked up from jail by a group of random strangers who just drove off with her. In a series of TikTok videos, a username Marilyn documents the moment that a disheveled looking Nikita comes out of the correctional center and runs straight towards them. The fan claimed that no one was there for Nikita and that she cried in their arms after they picked her up. She also posted disturbing videos of Nikita in the car where she looks completely strung out. Then the YouTuber was taken to a house with a large group of people where she appears to be behaving erratically and looks intoxicated while singing and dancing around, still wearing her clothes from jail. The title of the video read, we were the only ones there to pick her up. We stayed with her for as long as we needed. We learned so much about her and became good friends. While it sounds like this group of people did help her out, there were so many things that could have gone wrong in this kind of situation. Number six, no one was there for her. Amidst the unfolding chaos of Nikita's arrest, it became clear that no one in her own circle showed up for her when she needed the most. Not her friends, family, or management team, none of them were able to get her out of jail. That's something that was unfortunately left up to her fans. The video clip that went viral on TikTok shows the moment that she was getting picked up by a group of fans, and she was just waiting outside in the rain. The sad thing is that Nikita seemed to be taken aback when she realized that no one was waiting for her. The TikToker who posted the bail, Ivy Wyatt, said that he only did so when he called to inquire about her bond and realized that no one had even posted her bail. And at that point, she'd already been in jail for quite some time. The strange thing is that Nikita has a whole management team on payroll, and there's no reason that they couldn't have helped her out. Also, where are all her real friends? Something about this whole situation just seems off. Number five, shady management team. Everything about Nikita's team was a red flag in this situation. Their absence and frankly their incompetence during her arrest one of the first things that everyone noticed. Following her release, Nikita Dragon's public relations representative released a statement attacking the Miami-Dade County Corrections Department for placing her in a men's unit. Jack Ketsuyan said, the situation with Nikita, who is legally female, being placed in the men's unit of a Florida jail is extremely disturbing and dangerous. He also said that she is receiving professional treatment in a mental health care facility now and said that she is in a safe environment addressing her mental health. We ask for continued respect for her privacy and the sensitivity of this matter as she seeks treatment and healing. It's true that that is exactly what she needs right now, but clearly her team is never going to address the fact that they were unable to help their client when she needed it most. And they even put her in danger by making her rely on the kindness of strangers to get her out of jail. So it's no wonder fans are calling for her to take them off her payroll. Number four, disturbing fan video. The TikTok user Marilyn, who was a part of the group of fans who picked Nikita up from jail, filmed a disturbing video of the YouTuber when they brought her back to someone's house. In the video, you can see a disheveled looking Nikita surrounded by fans, still wearing her clothes from jail. She then starts singing out of nowhere and seems to be either intoxicated or going through some kind of a manic episode. The footage is concerning to say in the least, and many of the comments underneath the video have compared it to the Gabby Hanna incident, when she let a stranger and so-called fan into her home while she was strung out on medication. The guy named Nicholas apparently asked to use her washroom, entered her home, and then prayed with her, despite the fact that her friends told Gabby to get him out of there because she was home alone at the time. Luckily, he didn't hurt her, but he did film the entire inside and outside of her house and posted disturbing videos with her. Now, Nikita might not have been in that same kind of danger, but in the videos, you can clearly see that she is not all there and she seems to be really out of it. Number three, Miami Beach Hotel. We know that last week, the YouTuber was arrested after walking around naked at Miami Beach Hotel pool and causing a public disturbance. Police say when they got there, Nikita had been causing a disturbance for a long period of time. And when they asked her to cut it out, she became irate and threw water on the hotel staffers. Then when police and security went up to her room, she apparently opened the door after several knocks that ended up slamming the door in their faces. From that point on, things escalated very quickly. Nikita opened the door again and asked them, do you want more? She then swung at them with an open water bottle, which hit them and spilled all over them. At that point, she got handcuffed. Although it does make sense that she should be punished for these actions, some of her supporters have pointed out that nothing she did was that serious to warrant her arrest. So they think there has to be some other kind of hidden reason that she was taken to jail. Number two, the nightclub fight. Few people know that just hours before Nikita left the Miami Beach Hotel in handcuffs, she was also kicked out of a nightclub for getting into an altercation with two DJs. The incident occurred at Live, which is a Miami nightclub that attracts celebrity guests. And the DJ duo called Black Phoenix were performing there that night with 
with Afrojack. The musicians told NBC News that the fight started when Nikita tried to steal their liquor bottle, and when they told her off, she shoved them and became irate. The 26 year old then had to be escorted out of the venue by six security guards. In response, Nikita took to Twitter to defend herself, and she said she saw one of the men touch a woman inappropriately, and that's when the fight started. She tweeted, Bottom line, I see a man put hands on a woman, cause need you forget, I know I look like a doll on the outside, but I still hit like a dude. So whatever happened, Nikita had been behaving erratically even before she was arrested. And coming in at number one, mental health issues. Perhaps the biggest and most important red flag that we should have noticed about this crazy situation is that Nikita has been very open about struggling with her mental health prior to these violent outbursts. Last December, she admitted to her fans that she was involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital in Virginia for eight days starting on Thanksgiving Day. Then in a YouTube video posted in May that she's since deleted, she said she has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Although there is a debate to be had over whether or not that's a valid reason for her behavior, it does give us some clarity when we talk about her recent chaotic public appearances. So with all that said, it's quite obvious that Nikita has been dealing with issues concerning her mental health over the past year. But the fact that she's now seeking treatment for that is a step in the right direction. Number 10, bad at comedy. A wise person on Twitter said, James Corden might be a lot of things, but I draw the line at him being labeled a comedian. Aside from the fact that he's just straight up not funny, he seems to have an awful habit of failing to read the room and noticing when his poor jokes fall flat. Fans remember when he completely bombed at an AIDS research benefit gig in LA in 2017. In an effort to appear edgy, he brought up the Weinstein scandal that had just come out that very same week. In videos of the event, James said that it was a beautiful night in LA. So beautiful, Harvey has already asked to night up to his hotel to give him a massage. He ignores the loud groans from the audience and then says, it has been weird this week, hasn't it? Watching Harvey in hot water. Ask any of the women who watched him take a bath. The backlash against him was huge. And rightfully so, if you're going to make offensive jokes, you have to at least be funny. Number nine, ruining movies. James Corden's acting career started out well enough, but things went downhill fast as his fame grew. It's well known that he pretty much accepts every work offer that comes his way without much consideration, resulting in multiple flops. These included some truly awful movies like Cinderella, Lesbian Vampire Slayers, and The Emoji Movie. He also came under fire for exploiting gay stereotypes with his character in The Prom. But his most cringeworthy performance ever was in the movie Cats, where he played a creepy humanoid cat called Buster for Jones. The CGI human cats were literally sickening to look at and have been the subject of my nightmares for too long. The movie was a critically savage box office disaster. Despite James saying that he didn't regret his involvement, he later admitted that he would never ever watch the film himself. In fact, people are so sick of seeing him on the big screen and ruining every musical he touches that there is now a viral petition to keep James Corden out of the new Wicked movie. So far, it has more than 100,000 signatures. Number eight, rude to waiters. On Monday, the owner of a high-end New York City restaurant called Balthazar made a viral Instagram post blasting James Corden for his horrible behavior towards staff. He called him a tiny credit of a man and the worst customer to his service since the restaurant opened 25 years ago. He claimed that in one instance, James demanded two free rounds of drinks for him and his friends after he presented a hair that was found on his food and said, get us another round of drinks this second. And also take care of all our drinks so far. This way I won't write any nasty reviews on Yelp. On another occasion, he is said to have flipped out when an egg yolk omelet his wife ordered was found to have very little egg white in it. He allegedly went ballistic and started tearing into the waiter saying, maybe I should go into the kitchen and cook the omelet myself. According to the owner, James was so awful that he felt compelled to out him publicly and ban him from the restaurant. Something that is very rarely done in high-end establishments. Number seven, fight with Patrick Stewart. A clip from the 2010 Glamour Awards resurfaced recently where Patrick Stewart obliterates James Corden on stage and it's the definition of public humiliation. They were presenting an award together when Stewart suddenly decided to call him out for his disinterested attitude towards the ceremony. He said, when the presenters are up here and when the recipients are receiving their awards, don't stand at the back of the stage with your hands in your pockets, looking around as though you wished you were anywhere but here. Corden was super caught off guard at first and so was everyone else in the audience. He was obviously embarrassed and shot back with, if I looked like that, I'm sorry. But when you come up and present an award, just effing get on with it. Both of them should have moved on from there, but it somehow got even cringier when Stewart decided to make fun of Corden's weight. He said, from where I was sitting, I can see your belly. And that was over at the back of the room. But I continued back and forth for a few minutes, but it was so uncomfortable to watch, it felt more like hours. Number six, exposed on Reddit. In 2019, James wanted to 
to surprise fans by making an appearance on Reddit's infamous Ask Me Anything thread to promote a special edition of the show. But the plan massively backfired when users started flooding the thread talking about the horrible experiences they've had meeting him in real life. In the end, James was only able to answer three questions before he dipped. Probably because the truth was coming out about him and he was getting brutally roasted. One viral post said, Hey James, you won't remember me, but me and my friends sat at a table next to you and Harry Styles and some others in Manchurian Legends in London's Chinatown about six years ago. We didn't bother you, but you were a massively entitled C word who yelled and treated the wait staff like crap. And when one of my party politely suggested that you calm down, you got really aggressive and threatening. So my question is, why did Harry seem so cool while well, you were a massive throbbing bell end? Number five, flight incident. This one absolutely boils my blood. We're going to talk about the infamous Reddit post that horrified the internet. Half an hour into a New York to London flight, passengers in business class noticed a woman with a crying baby being brought through the curtains by a flight attendant. They looked on in mild horror as they saw the attendant direct her into an empty seat next to James Corden. They were expecting him to throw a fit, but instead he simply put on a pair of noise cancelling headphones, pulled an eye mask over his eyes and turned away from her to sleep. Pretty decent of him, right? When the plane landed, passengers were surprised to see him remain seated as the woman with the baby struggled to open the overhead locker. And even more surprised when she turned to him and said, for F's sake, can you at least hold the baby while I get the bags? The woman was his wife. The baby was his baby. That's the father of the year right there. Number four, fake persona. While Corden's public image is of a lovable Brit, his behavior in private has been described by some as less than desirable. And that is an understatement. For many people, the nice guy public persona has worn thin and there are too many cases where the mask has slipped, revealing a more arrogant and spiteful side to him. Corden increasingly gained a reputation, all for behaving badly towards the people who work for him and with him. One allegation by comedian and podcaster Jack Allison was that he attended a Writers Guild Association meeting specifically to advocate for lowering the pay of his late night writers. Uh, how disgusting is that? He was also allegedly extremely rude to production assistants and staff while filming the UK game show A League of Their Own. To sum it all up, the editor-in-chief of Hard Drive magazine Jeremy Kalpowitz tweeted, James Corden is the most worked with the robots to betray the humans and get put back into the matrix as a famous actor person who has ever existed. Number three, pretend driving. Carpool karaoke was one of the most popular segments on The Late Show. But on the 2nd of January in 2020, fans spotted Corden filming a new episode with Justin Bieber and shared the video to Twitter. Rather than being on the road, the black SUV was being towed by a tow truck and Corden was pretending to drive it. The viral video led to mass outrage on social media, with many people criticizing the host for being deceptive and labeling him as an outright phony. He really had no choice but to address the scandal and said, fake news, I always drive the car, unless we're doing something where we think it might not be safe. He did admit that the car had been towed on rare occasions, but maintained that 95% of the time he was driving it. The thing is that a lot of people tuned into his show only for carpool karaoke. So the fact that it was staged made the episodes feel artificial and took a lot of the fun out of it. Number two, doesn't know his own crew. Amidst the growing controversy, other videos exposing James Corden have resurfaced online. And one shows the awkward moment when he was asked to name members of his own TV crew and he couldn't do it. In the video from 2016, Jimmy Kimmel appeared on The Late Show for a game called Spill Your Guts or Fill Your Guts, a truth or dare game that gives guests the option of eating disgusting foods or answering personal questions. He then tells James, name two of the cameramen in this room. He started laughing because it was obvious that he didn't know. Then he just said, that is a great question. It's a different crew tonight, actually. In the end, he had to drink a fish smoothie because he couldn't name the crew members. Then, if you think that was a coincidence, one year later, during a Q&A segment with his audience, one crowd member asked him to name a cameraman and he failed once again. I mean, this is far from the worst thing that he's ever done, but it does go to show you that he doesn't really care about the people that work underneath him. And coming in at number one, universally disliked. If you want to know how the majority of people really feel about James Corden, just spend five minutes on Twitter. When Ryanair announced on Twitter that they had also banned James from flying with them, the reactions were hilarious. So many memes flooded the platform of people claiming that he had been banned from other random places like the Glee Club or Fortnite. A meme even went viral of Dakota Johnson looking excited with the caption, watching the long awaited downfall of James Corden. One user wrote, I don't need James Corden banned from Balthazar. I need him banned from movie musicals. Someone else tweeted, a reminder that James Corden is an utter, utter prick, an unfunny bellend of a man. There's a reason he's hated in the UK. Here he is being a wanker to Patrick Stewart who called him out for being unprofessional. Former TMZ journalist Morgan
Morgan Tremaine said that James Corden is a prime example of fame obliterating someone's sense of basic decency towards other people. Someone even called him the late night version of Ellen, so it's a wonder that he has any fans left at all. Number 10, Seizing Control. As part of a countersuit regarding the dispute surrounding the sale of the winery shares, Angelina Jolie's former company Novell has claimed that Brad Pitt wanted only to control the winery estate, Chateau Miravel, and that is why he is upset about the selling of the shares. In actuality, they claim he only wanted to control the joint financial venture and for years has been pushing them out and wasting assets on lavish projects that they deem completely unnecessary and unrelated to the winery's success, including a swimming pool and a recording studio, which I gotta say, doesn't seem super relevant to making wine, but you know. Number 9, Juliette Lewis. While this relationship has been lovingly reminisced on by both Juliette Lewis and Brad Pitt, the fact remains that it's kind of an odd one, even for the time period. The two ended up meeting on the set of California, with both of them being considered young, hopeful talents of Hollywood at the time. They dated for four years and seemed to have a great and beautiful romance, and just as Brad Pitt was actually getting ready to blow up, basically. But there was something a little odd about this relationship. When they started seeing each other, there was a 10 year gap between them. Now this might not seem super strange considering there have been, you know, bigger age gaps in celebrity couples and in regular couples and for some that still seems pretty normal. But the real weird part of it was that they were at two very different sort of points in their life, with Brad being 27 or turning 27 and Juliet only being 17. Yeah, so she was still in high school. Which I mean, I guess they could still connect over work, both being performers, but other than that their life experiences would have been probably pretty different at that point. Some people still find this to be an odd relationship today, especially considering it managed to go strong for four years. However, both of them still remember it pretty fondly. Although they no longer talk, which I think is pretty weird, but I guess it was a long time ago. Number eight, the divorce. I think one of the biggest red flags that people tend to overlook in cases like this is when things drag on. It's never a good sign, and it can usually mean that there are bigger issues that are kind of being like danced around, but not really unearthed or talked about. People who are able to put the past behind them and just move forward generally have nothing to dance around. That's why it's, you know, so easy for them to just move forward with their lives. They have let go and they don't hold things against their former partner. But with Brad and Angelina, both of them seem to be struggling to let go and are still stuck in disagreements with each other even to this day, which could be an indicator that there is a bigger reason as to why they split other than just deciding to go their own way. And that's what we're beginning to see really delved into now as Jolie seems to realize that she maybe has to lay it all out or she'll never really be free. That she is to dive into some traumatic moments that she perhaps would have rather been kept a little bit more private and less publicized. There's also the fact that it took them three years to get themselves legally declared as single. Just declared as single, which is a long time. A standard divorce, by the way, takes between four to six months to get finalized, although obviously when there's custody battles and stuff involved, it can take longer. But it's still been a long time, even considering that. Number seven, addiction. After the split between Brad and Angelina, Pitt cited personal problems is one of the issues for sort of the arguments that led to their divorce. In response, he decided it was time to do something about these problems and admitted himself to AA. This might not be a red flag in the sense that obviously going to AA is a good thing if you have a problem all in all, but it is a red flag that he did so right after the divorce, implying that his misuse had gotten to the point that it was dramatically affecting his life, with the divorce and whatever happened to trigger it kind of acting as a wake up call for him, which kind of could be an indicator that there's something worse there. At least there was in the past, you know? Number six, NDA. In the current legal battle between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, the two are now feuding over the winery that they once shared and what Angelina decided to do with said shares. Initially, the two had an agreement that they would get clearance before selling. But when Jolie sold her shares behind Pitt's back, he protested. It was reported that Jolie wanted out of the joint business ventures and that Pitt was willing to buy the shares, but then their deal fell through. And this was apparently after months of them negotiating. Well, Pitt claims this this was so that Jolie could purposefully harm him after he was awarded shared custody of their six children. Jolie claims that their deal actually fell through because Pitt wanted her to sign an NDA as part of the sale to him. Jolie was unwilling to sign that NDA as she felt this would limit her capacity to speak the truth of why their marriage dissolved and problems surrounding it. She obviously just didn't want to be silenced, if that is the case. While the two have differing stories as to why this deal fell apart, if Jolie is speaking true, why did Brad want to keep her quiet and what were the terms? terms of the NDA covering. Also, if it was their relationship, how is that related to selling the winery? That doesn't seem like it should be included at all. Number five, Harvey Weinstein. Although some say that Brad Pitt was one of the few who stood up to 
Epstein, this unfortunately wasn't always the case. When it comes to his relationship with the notorious producer, many tell of the 1995 story where Pitt stood up to him to protect his then girlfriend Gwyneth Paltrow, who confessed that Weinstein had severely mistreated her, which to be honest is an understatement. However, what those people seem to be missing or not focusing on is the fact that after this incident, although Pitt did stand up to him, he also later worked with him. What? The 2009 film Inglorious Bass, which Pitt starred in, was both distributed by and co-financed by the wine company. Angelina Jolie claims that Brad Pitt also approached the producer to work on his 2012 film, Killing Them Softly, whose company ended up as the distributor for that film, which really hurt her because she also had a bad experience with him too. So like what? Also pretty messed up I feel like if you do that when you know your wife is like please don't work with this person. Number four, she said. So Brad Pitt is complicated when it comes to his history with Harvey Weinstein. He privately spoke out against him years ago in the 90s when he you know actively threatened the man when he put his hands on Paltrow but then he was willing to work with him in 2009 and the 2010s. In 2019 he spoke out against the man however disavowing him and sharing the story of his experience defending Paltrow in the 90s. He also went on to executive produced the film she said. Some people though deem this to be quite controversial considering that Brad Pitt also seemed to be willing to work with him only a few years ago, which seems hypocritical. Is it all a show or does Brad Pitt genuinely condemn this man? She said is a film that follows the New York Times investigation of one and is also being produced by Pitt's production company, Plan B Entertainment. Number three, allegations. Recently, things have escalated quite a bit in the legal cases between Brad and Angelina, with Angelina even bringing up a previous incident that seems to be the inciting one in terms of their divorce. She alleges that Brad severely mistreated her and their children while on a flight, and based on the account given, that's truly an understatement here. It's said that Brad Pitt was under the influence and verbally attacked Angelina before turning on the kids when they came to their mother's defense, even getting physical. She also has attested that she and the kids are willing to provide evidence of this in court and she's even willing to testify. Number two, the kids don't want to see him. While Brad Pitt reportedly does see his younger kids but prefers to do so unphotographed, which honestly makes sense. I mean, who wants paparazzi around at all really to photograph anything other than maybe like a movie premiere? That's the only time I think. It's also reported that he perhaps hasn't seen his older kids in years. In fact, according to a source for US Weekly, Pitt does not have any kind of relationship with his eldest son, Maddox, and doesn't talk to Pax either. In fact, it seems that the inciting incident on the airplane in 2016 is likely where the breakdown of the relationship between son Maddox and father Brad began. The source is saying ever since then, it's been really rough between them. However, according to a source for People, Pitt does still see and maintain a good relationship with his younger children, having nightly dinners with them whenever they are in LA. But it's interesting that his older kids kids seem to not want to see him, especially as you know they're older so they kind of have more, I guess, more agency in making that choice. Number one, testimony. Maddox doesn't only not have a good relationship with his father, but reportedly also testified against him during the custody battle. Although we don't know exactly what was said, an exclusive source told US Weekly, Maddox has already given testimony as an adult in the ongoing custody dispute, and it wasn't very flattering towards Brad. It's also been said that the distance is so great that Maddox even wants to legally change his name. The source added, he doesn't use Pitt as his last name on documents that aren't legal, and instead uses Jolie. Maddox wants to legally change his last name to Jolie, which Angelina has said she doesn't support. Number 10, old videos. Since the scandal broke, so many people have been searching through videos of Ned and Alex together, and the result is very telling. Every single video gets progressively worse when you realize that Ned and Alex had been seeing each other in secret. In fact, most of the content with them together has not aged well at all, because you can clearly see the two of them flirting on camera. There was a video of Ned where he looked genuinely disappointed that Alex didn't pick him to team up with her for a game, and another video where he was in the hot tub laying his head on her lap, while the other guys exchanged uncomfortable glances at each other. Alex clearly didn't seem to mind though, but it was very strange because he was still her boss. One of the comments on the video says, how was it just normal for a married man to put his head on another woman's thighs, and we all ignore it. In fact, if you go through the past Try Guys' videos, there are just so many clues that Alex was Ned's side piece. It's insane. Talk about foreshadowing. Number 9. Defending Alex For some reason, the Try Guys seem to be pretty confident defending the woman who was cheating with Ned. In fact, all of them still follow Alex Herring on social media. In their new video statement, Eugene pleaded with fans to exercise kindness because women tend to get more hate than men on the internet in this kind of situation. He was insinuating that Alex has been receiving a 
lot of criticism from fans and they need to back off. So even though she cheated on her own fiance Will Thayer and emotionally ruined Ned's wife Ariel, it seems like Alex is walking away from all of this without a scratch. The Try Guys haven't publicly denounced her like they did with their executive producer and they have made no moves to fire her. Although that could be a legal risk for the company because as an employee, she could argue that she was coerced to enter the relationship because of the power that Ned had over her in the workplace. So the situation is certainly complicated. Number 8. They all knew Despite the fact that they've known each other for years and built a successful brand together, the rest of the Try Guys wasted no time in cutting ties with their friend and released a statement just two days after the news broke out. On their official Instagram page, they stated that Ned had been fired. Quote, Ned Fulmer is no longer working for the Try Guys. As a result of an internal review, we do not see a path forward together. We thank you for your support as we navigate through this change. This action was so swift that it surprised a lot of people. But this is because they actually found out about Ned's affair four weeks before they made the announcement. Keith confirmed that the Try Guys were alerted to the scandal on September the 5th. And from there, the company launched a three week investigation into his actions. An inside source claimed that during the investigation, it was discovered that the employees knew what was up between Ned and Alec because they noticed flirting, lunchtime hookups, occasional sleepovers, and that the two of them constantly went to events together. Number seven, multiple women. An Instagram page called Dumois has come forward with several blind items that claim that Ned cheated on Ariel with more than one woman, and some of the allegations date back several years. One anonymous user claiming to be a former BuzzFeed employee said, this is not his first rodeo. Trust me, he's always been like this, and I can confirm that someone else might be coming forward because there have been other former BuzzFeed employees and former co-workers from BuzzFeed that know things and have experienced things. There are a lot of things about Ned that will spill in the next few days. Another user recounted her own story involving Ned. She wrote, Early in 2016, I had just turned 21 and was doing stupid stuff. I sent Ned Fulmer a sexy selfie of me on Snapchat. He responded asking for more and this went on for a few months. He was coming to Miami with the Try Guys and wanted to meet up one on one. I ended up declining. I'm positive this is just the first girl he's been caught with. Number 6. Fake Personas The success of the Try Guys' brand really has nothing to do with the content that they put out there. It's more about their performance of authenticity and the promise that the character on screen and the human behind the character are largely the same. This is especially true in their characters as nice guys. Keith even said, quote, there's always some layer of performance on top of who you are. So the more I've been able to cultivate Keith as a character and have me be the same is great. So in other words, even real life Keith said that he wants to be more like the Keith that's on screen. And because all of the Try Guys are very publicly partnered, that only added to their personas. Ned actually said, I became kind of known for my own relationship. And then we did more of it. I just kind of do it because digital media and YouTube culture is kind of showing who you are as a person. But in the end, this became the channel's downfall because when Ned's facade fell away, the fans felt lied to. Number five, year long affair. Like a stubborn weed that won't stop sprouting, the Ned Fulmer cheating scandal is blooming at a rapid pace. There is now a claim out there that their workplace relationship actually dates back to December last year. A source close to Will Thayer, Alex's ex fiance, said that Will went through her phone and saw that her and Ned had first hooked up on a work trip in December. Will was able to forgive Alex, but apparently he reached out to Ned, warning him to back off. Then at the start of September, both Will and Ariel received photos and videos of Ned and Alex making out at a club, as well as holding hands in public while they were out in New York City. The timing was incredibly awkward because Ariel had just landed in New York to hang out with the group when she received those messages. She then confronted Ned, who confirmed that he and Alex had been in a relationship for almost a year. Upon finding out, Ariel then hightailed it out of the city and flew back to LA. Which makes complete sense because how could she stay there after that? Number 4. Sneaking around Fans started to suspect that Ned was cheating when they noticed that he wasn't involved in the group's videos for the last couple of weeks. In late September, the tweet that prefaced the drama wrote, Ned has not been present in some of the recent Try Guys' projects. Ned does not appear in the past 3 videos or intros. He also was not in the past 3 podcast episodes. As the main producer and one of the faces of the company, fans found this extremely worrying and pretty soon 
soon it started to look like one of the Try Guys was trying infidelity. So they became more vigilant of his appearances on the channel. It was also very suspicious that Ned and Alex were seen in an Instagram photo promoting Keith's new Eat the Menu series, but they were not seen in the final cut of the video. So Ned had essentially been absent quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, but now we know that the company was most likely investigating him at the time. So he might have even been suspended from the workplace entirely. Number three, Buzzfeed reaction. They say that no one knows you better than your co-workers. And in Ned's case, that might be true as well. Former Buzzfeed alum Devin Lytle tweeted, 2022, the year we realized that wife guys are still guys. Jasmine Robbins posted a cryptic meme with Kermit the Frog and wrote, y'all shocked? So she made it seem like the affair between Ned and Alex was something of an open secret back when they both worked at Buzzfeed. One Twitter user responded by saying, makes me feel like Ned had wandering eyes for a long time. Maybe that's why he made the I love my wife thing his thing, to overcompensate. Couples who always flaunt how happy they are and in love they are usually have something to prove. It was right in front of us the whole time, I guess. So it's entirely possible that Ned's on camera nice guy persona was exactly that, just a persona, and that behind the scenes he has no issues cheating on his wife. Number two, office hookup. In such a small workplace, a lot of people are wondering how it is that the Try Guys didn't seem to notice the affair. Because according to their new video statement, Ned had admitted to them that it had been going on for quite some time. Ned was the executive producer of the Try Guys. The 35 year old comedian and author founded the group in 2014 while working for Buzzfeed. So he was pretty much at the top of the office pyramid. Alex Herring, on the other hand, worked under Ned as the associate producer. And even though Ned called it a consensual workplace relationship, everyone knows that Alex was his employee. In fact, she's been featured in tons of videos over the years and casual fans of the channel have gotten to know her pretty well. It's obvious that everyone in the Try Guys' workplace is very close with each other. So a lot of people are scratching their heads at how such a problematic relationship was allowed to flourish unnoticed. And number one, their audience. If you've watched any of the Try Guys' videos, references to Ned's wife abounded from the very beginning. In fact, just the way he says, my wife has earned catchphrase status and inspired countless compilation videos and even official Try Guys merchandise, including a figurine with a plastic Ned that repeats the phrase, my wife at the press of a button. In general, fans felt that the Try Guys were walking examples of non-toxic masculinity. And so the men were put on a bit of a pedestal. In fact, of the more than 7.5 million subscribers to their channel, the vast majority of the audience is women, nearly 80%. The age demographic is young women in their late teens and early 20s. Having a large female audience is not a red flag, but it goes to show you that there was always a performative aspect to the group's feminism. I mean, that's the whole reason for their fan base. In a way, Ned's infidelity proves that the Try Guys do not necessarily hold the same values that they claim to represent on screen. Number 10, the Errors Tour. If you've been on the internet recently, then you'll have probably heard about the Ticketmaster disaster that happened with Taylor Swift's The Errors Tour pre-sale. Basically, over 3.5 million people registered to get a pre-sale code from Ticketmaster's verified fan system, but only 1.5 million fans were sent codes to access the pre-sale. The company then said that due to bot attacks, as well as fans who didn't have codes, they reported that 3.5 billion total system requests were recorded during the pre-sale. As a result, fans were stuck for hours and the website itself was frozen or kept crashing at checkout. In the end, 2.4 million tickets were sold during the pre-sale alone. Ticketmaster then cancelled the general sale due to what they called insufficient remaining ticket inventory to meet that demand. Essentially, the verified fan system is meant to ensure that fans get their hands on tickets before bots and resellers do. But shortly after the pre-sale, tickets began popping up on ticket resale websites for ridiculous amounts of money. Number nine, scalping. It's been proven time and time again that Ticketmaster facilitates price gouging by encouraging scalping. The company actually runs a secondary ticket market called Ticketmaster Resale, where they charge a second, more lucrative fee in addition to the fee on the primary ticket market. So by allowing scalpers to buy up the majority of tickets, Ticketmaster can essentially assess a second fee on consumers who missed out on the initial sale of concert tickets. Fans were shocked earlier this year when tickets to Harry Styles' concert went from the regularly priced $200 to over $1,000 at his tour's only Canadian stop, which prompted fans to start a petition pleading for cheaper options. Not to mention the recent Taylor Swift tickets, which have now been priced at tens of thousands of dollars on resale websites. For instance, for the show at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, they're now listed for as much as $21,600 on StubHub. Not to mention that floor tickets for her show in Atlanta are listed for as much as $35,000. 
October 8th the investigation. It was announced this week that the Justice Department has opened an antitrust investigation into the owner of Ticketmaster. After the sale of Taylor Swift, concert tickets descended into chaos. The investigation is set to focus on whether or not Ticketmaster's parent company, Live Nation Entertainment, has misused its power over the multi-billion dollar industry. The Justice Department's antitrust division has recently contacted music venues and participants in the ticket industry to learn more about Live Nation's methods. In fact, Tennessee's Attorney General, Jonathan Scrimetti, said that he is launching a separate investigation called a consumer protection investigation into them. He said he's concerned that the company lacks competition, and with that, customers are left with sky-high prices and a poor experience. He also questioned Ticketmaster's lack of preparation, and said that given the company's size, they should have been ready for the unprecedented demand from Taylor Swift's fans. Number 7 Shady Practices Ticketmaster has been able to get away with all sorts of things due to lack of competition. They can refuse to share how many tickets are sold and at what price or how many are available, which allows them to create artificial scarcity. Not only that, but they can also get away with hiding many fees on top of the ticket price and not showing them until after you select the tickets. In fact, the company has frequently lobbied against transparency laws that would require them to explain these extra costs to buyers. Then there's the so-called dynamic pricing, which is a relatively new system used by Ticketmaster that sets prices based on demand. So the more people waiting in line for tickets, the higher the prices go. They'll label these dynamically priced tickets as platinum seating, and even even though the name suggests a great location, these seats can in fact be located anywhere in a venue. For certain shows, the company will simply reserve a number of tickets to have a price that can fluctuate higher or lower based on demand. Number 6. No Competition in 2010, Ticketmaster purchased Live Nation, which runs a ton of event venues and has an artist management business. So basically, anytime Ticketmaster had any kind of competition, they would just buy it out, which is why they have no rivals to this day. The Justice Department did approve the merger of Ticketmaster and Live Nation, although that decision brought about a lot of criticism at the time, considering that it created a giant in the industry that still has no equals in its reach or power. The merger was met with pushback from several activist groups and artists like Bruce Springsteen, who was upset at Ticketmaster for steering his fans towards its own secondary platform. And so in 2009, he wrote a letter to his fans saying, the one thing that would make the current ticket situation even worse for the fan than it is now would be Ticketmaster and Live Nation coming up with a single system, thereby returning us to a near monopoly situation in music ticketing. Number 5. Pearl Jam's Protest In 1994, America's most powerful rock band swore off using the ticketing giant during their summer tour. They were committed to ending the hidden costs passed on to their fans, so Pearl Jam laid down guidelines for their upcoming tour, which was to be a $1.80 service fee clearly spelled out on top of the $18 tickets. To put that into perspective, Ticketmaster was used to charging a service fee that was two or three times that amount. Essentially, the band wanted to put their principles ahead of payday, so they decided to tour without using Ticketmaster, but eventually they found it too difficult and returned to the service after only 14 months. Although their protests did fail, they filed an antitrust complaint against Ticketmaster, which ended up triggering a federal investigation into the company. In response, a spokesperson from the company said, Getting attacked by a superstar rock band is a lot like being accused of kicking your dog. There's a general presumption of guilt until proven innocent. But until Pearl Jam raised the issue, Ticketmaster's exclusive contracts were essentially invisible to consumers. Number 4. The Criticism Artists have long been critical of Ticketmaster and their problematic behavior. But after the Taylor Swift fiasco, the dominoes really started falling. Congressman David Sicilian tweeted, Ticketmaster's excessive wait times and fees are completely unacceptable, as seen with today's Taylor Swift tickets, and are a symptom of a larger problem. It's no secret that Live Nation Ticketmaster is an unchecked monopoly. Then Ilhan Omar tweeted, Break up Ticketmaster. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez also slammed the company, writing, Daily reminder that Ticketmaster is a monopoly. Its merger with Live Nation should never have been approved, and they need to get it reined in. Break them up. And let's not forget when John Oliver described Ticketmaster as one of the most hated companies on earth, and he called out its high prices and scarce availability on his late show. In general, the approach that the company has taken on its ruthless journey to dominance has caused endless controversy.
Number three, the settlement. As recently as 2019, the Competition Bureau ordered Ticketmaster to pay a penalty of $4.5 million for misleading customers on online ticket sales. The news comes after the Bureau found Ticketmaster's advertised prices did not at all reflect the true cost to the consumer because they added fees later in the process that in some cases added more than 65% to the cost. So essentially the initial prices were misleading despite consumers seeing the additional fees before completing their transaction. Then ironically, that same year, the Department of Justice found that Ticketmaster had been violating the terms of the settlement by forcing venues to accept their services as a condition for hosting Live Nation performers and retaliating against those that refused. So despite the fact that they had to fork out millions of dollars in the settlement, the company continues to be as shady as ever and they went straight back to their unethical practices. Number two, artists speaking out. Both musicians and fans have been outraged with Ticketmaster for decades. Many have tried to take them down down, but to no avail. One of the most notable examples was in 1994, when Pearl Jam's guitarist Stone Gossard said, it is well known in our industry that some portion of the service charges Ticketmaster collects on its sale of tickets is distributed back to its promoters and the venues. It is this incestuous relationship and the lack of any national competition for Ticketmaster that has created the situation we're dealing with today. Bruce Springsteen also came out against the company in 2009. At the time, his fans complained that when they were trying to buy tickets at face value on the website, they were then directed to a subsidiary site with tickets listed by resellers at hundreds of dollars more than their original price. In response, the singer's team released a statement condemning the company. Following his response, many other artists have since spoken out against their ridiculous fees. And coming in at number one, pressure on live music. We know that the prices for concert tickets constantly seem to be on the rise. In a 2011 interview, the ex-CEO of Ticketmaster, Fred Rosen, explained that as the internet became a bigger part of people's lives, the amount and speed at which sites could sell tickets exploded. That combined with a number of industry changes that forced artists to rely on live music way more than record sales ended up transforming concerts into the expensive industry that they are today. Rosen said, it used to be you made the record and toured to support the record. Now you tour to make money because pricing has caught up with value and the albums don't sell on the same level. So with that said, it's clear that now more than ever, the pressure to make money is being placed on touring rather than records. So the game has essentially changed and the result is ridiculously high fees for concert goers. 